So here we have two works of 1968 and 1965. This one is called uh, Personnage dans la nuit, or a personage uh, in the evening, and over here, Personnage and stars in the evening. So they're, in a sense, nocturnal landscapes. And three years separate them, but Miro's figuration in both is very, very similar. This piece, which is really the, just the, the, the black, it's a black piece of canvas that's placed against this red ground, but this piece almost looks like uh, an Asian scroll. And in fact, Miro in the 1960s made two trips to Japan and studied calligraphy with a master calligrapher and was very, very interested in the Japanese tradition of mark making and of calligraphy. What's so interesting is to see similar figuration, both done in the form of nocturnes, but over here he incorporates a collage. And if you take a look, some of this material obviously is not just fine art paper from his studio. These are other things that maybe were thrown away. Perhaps a, a, a child's mask is what this looks like, that he then repurposes and reuses, turns upside down, and now creates a fantastic personage flying in the night sky with the stars. This gallery is dedicated also to Miro's treatment of uh, the figure. And the centerpiece of this gallery is a very important painting from 1929, which is called La Fonarina after Raphael. La Fonarina is a painting of a beautiful woman by Raphael that was thought to be, or some historians think was, Raphael's mistress. And so Miro takes a kind of found object, a very famous painting, and in this series of what are called imaginary portraits, he then submits them to, uh, again, his own act of deformation. So La Fonarina's eye now becomes this fantastic fish her hair uh, and hat become this incredible uh, uh, organic brown form. Her chest and breasts become enormously enlarged and bulbous, and the entire body is just reduced to something that almost looks like a volcano. One of the things that Miro was interested in here is color, and interested in thinking about color as a kind of structure. This, you know, 30 years before the color field painters in America, people like Barnett Newman and Mark Rothko uh, were doing that. So he takes colors that are on the very dark range uh, of the color spectrum and forces you to make all sorts of visual distinctions and to really look uh, at the painting and look at it in terms of color as structure. Here, is a wonderful drawing called uh, The Acrobats. And I'm not sure if this is entirely true, this is 1937, but uh, Miro was a very close friend of Sandy Calder. And in fact, Calder, when he was developing his famous circus, actually showed uh, the circus uh, to the farmers by Miro's farm in Monoroch del Cam, which is two hours south of Barcelona. So I think that there's always an element of acrobatics uh, and of circus imagery that appears in Miro's uh, work. Next to it are uh, two wonderful drawings, and I just want to point out that just as Miro is having a dialogue with Raphael, he had dialogues with Matisse, and here he has a dialogue with uh, Picasso in these monstrous, aggressive uh, forms with figures with, with tooth-like, with fang-like uh, teeth. So these uh, I just wanted to put together and to talk about uh, Miro's challenge to the hierarchies of the body. So this room, we just have three uh, collages, and Miro was one of the most brilliant collage artists of the 20th century. This one is an untitled drawing collage of 1934 in which Miro took, took a poster of the Columbus Monument, 
which is on the bottom of the Ramblas in Barcelona. And this was constructed, it began construction in 1882, but it was really constructed for the 1888 Universal Exposition. So here you can see um, that uh, the exhibition was inaugurado, inaugurated in June of 18. 88. So he takes a 19th century uh, lithographic uh, poster as the basis, the monument to Colón or to Columbus, as the basis upon which he adds all sorts of figuration. And over here, you have images that are typically the cliches of Spain, the torero with his sword and his cape, and of course the bulls. But the irony is that the monument to Columbus does not celebrate uh, Columbus as the discoverer of the new world for Spain, but rather the Catalan industrial class uh, had this monument built and all of the sculptures on the monument represent Catalans and Catalan interests in the new world. But I suspect that all of these monsters that Miro paints or draws on top of the column have a very political uh, meaning. At other times, he uses different types of collage elements. These are decals for flowers, for fish, for a mallard or male uh, duck. And what we really have, it's, called, it's from a series called Metamorphoses, and what we have is a male and a female uh, figure, the female with her two breasts and the fish as a kind of not very polite surrogate for her anatomy and the male duck representing the male figure. There's always elements of eroticism and sexuality and sometimes black humor in Miro's collages. This room, which is going to be roped off, we don't want people to enter it, but we have two objects in the collection made in 1973 that require conservation. And we think it's very interesting for people to see a conservator at work because uh, there is so much to be learned from studying Miro's materials and how he physically put things uh, together. So during the exhibition, we will have a conservator working on one of these two objects uh, at a time. And when the object is, is finished, when the work is done, they'll be hung on the wall. And the idea is to do documentary photographs and perhaps a video log of the whole development so people can learn a lot about Miro's approach to his mediums, to techniques, uh, and to materials, which were enormously important for him. This room is filled with paintings that have a grid-like structure, a quadricula, or a series of horizontal and vertical lines in which the figure almost disappears into the grid. This entire wall is work that was done two years before Miro's death. He died in 1983, and these are all works on paper of 1981. You can see again how Miro uses very unorthodox materials, and he responds to the textures which suggest elements uh, of his figuration. And in this work, which I'm particularly fond of, it almost seems to relate to de Kooning's paintings of women uh, of the late, of the early 1950s and to other works of the late 1940s where de Kooning, in a sense, uh, breaks up the anatomy of the figure and redistributes it all across uh, the surface. And you can see in a, a drawing which is done uh, on a a sheet of paper that looks like it's a letter behind it. I've never been able to take this out of the frame, but I will, and we'll document what is on the other side uh, of uh, the sheet of paper. But you can see it's clearly a uh, female uh, figure, highly abstracted, but what is figure and what is sort of a grid-like structure is very hard to determine. There's a constant movement in and out of figuration and just pure graphic lines. This gallery shows a number of the weavings 
that Miro did in 1973. He did a whole series of them. And they were executed in an abandoned flour mill in the city of Tarragona, which is about two hours south of Barcelona on the Mediterranean coast. Miro did these in collaboration with a young man by the name of Josep Royo, who was only 25 years old at the time, but Miro had seen some of Royo's weavings and he thought they were extraordinarily powerful uh, objects and he was surprised at how young uh, Royo was. So Miro commissioned Royo to make these very elaborate woven backgrounds. And collectively, this whole group are called, in Catalan, sobre teixin. The word uh, teixit is, uh, is, is a fabric, a textile. Teixin doesn't exist, but it has a nice uh, ring to it, and sobra being on top. So things that are done on top of textiles. And this is, rather than a tapestry, it really is a kind of very coarse textile in which Miro uses rope, and he uses uh, jute, and all different types uh, of materials, and Royo weaves them together with very elaborate knots in the background. Miro then found that the surfaces still looked a little too pure, so he took a torch and began burning them. And he made these, and that's where you can see the blackened areas, he made these just before he began the burned canvas uh, that we talked about downstairs. So that's a continuation of his work in December of 1971. And then he added, he paints on top, and then he adds all sorts of figurative uh, elements. And one of the most beautiful here is a pail that was used to paint some of the Object. So you actually see the process in which Miro was creating his work. And over here, and this is terribly witty, he attaches a piece of blue felt. And the suggestion is that of blue paint pouring out of the canvas. So again, the idea that metaphorically, one object can substitute for another object. The experience of painting can be communicated through a piece of fabric like felt. In this one, which was one of the first to be done, this is done in wool as opposed to different types uh, of rope. And this too was done by uh, Giuseppe uh, Royo. You can see that Miro has incorporated one of the tubes that the yarn was wrapped uh, around. So it, in a sense, it becomes a kind of document of the creation of the work, of the artistic process. And you'll find the same figuration here done in a very literal way with pieces of canvas that have been cut out. And Miro liked the idea that everything would not just lay flat, that it would have an almost sculptural effect. But you'll see this exactly in his paintings as well. I wanted to show the Sobre Teixins in the same space or in a related gallery as a series of drawings that Miro made a bit earlier in the 1960s. If the Sobre Teixims are all about materials, uh, physicality, texture, uh, objects from the real world, these images are about the void. They're about empty space. They're, they have an almost zen-like quality. These three drawings are from a series that Miro did, all on the same size paper. There are about 100 drawings in all. They're done in uh, India ink on paper. And you can see the way, by just a few lines, Miro structures this extraordinary empty space. The tapestries on the other wall, this, I, I'm attempting to show two very different sides of Miro's artistic personality. The painter of the void, the painter of open space, and an artist who was deeply, deeply involved with materials and techniques and textures in his work.